do you see some of the trends that we've been discussing this morning really playing out among payers? What are the, what are the top level things that you would highlight for us? Let's give a little bit of um, background uh, to help in answering that question. So in the United States, there are roughly uh, 330 or so million uh, people. We have predominantly a system made up of Medicare, Medicaid, and commercial coverage. But in each one of them, there's at least two segmentations, one being the more managed side of it and the other one being the more fee-for-service side of it. So in Medicare Advantage, today we have roughly 14 million of roughly 50 million uh, uh, total members of Medicare. 14, roughly, are managed Medicare in what's called Medicare Advantage. In managed Medicaid, um, we have uh, a similar sized population. The majority over the last few years since 2008, uh, the financial crisis has forced quite a few more of them into the managed Medicaid uh, segment. And then starting January 1st, if we can work through some of the technical glitches, we're going to have a whole nother arrival onto this managed landscape called the commercial managed uh, HIX population. So, the thing that I think was very interesting that ties together today's discussion is the rise of relevancy of healthcare data. So if you look back to the Pacific Northwest, you only have to go 20 years ago before you saw the first managed Medicaid program evolve with just a few hundred thousand members. And since that roughly 20 year ago period to call it January when you're gonna have roughly 70 million people in these managed programs, the vast majority of which growth has occurred from roughly 2005 through 2014. So you're gonna go from roughly a few million to roughly 70 million in just call it seven years. And the commonality in those managed populations are four things. A, quality now matters at the individual level. Disease and comorbidity status now matters at the individual level. Utilization, our MLR, now matters at the individual level. And compliance and reporting now matters at the individual level. So unlike the actuarial approach of mass populations under care, where you are layering an administrative fee on top, now you have this capitation concept with all of these caveats of quality, disease status, utilization status, and compliance, these four corner posts which are dependent on member level data. So in all the commonalities, whether it be IMS's presentations, whether it be the Walgreens presentations, whether it be the IBM or the Dell presentations, all of us are looking at what the data, which is now increasingly uh, available and now can be used to actually change the quality of care, the utilization of care, the efficiencies of care, the outcomes of care, uh, and the marketing and financial performance of care down to the consumerism level um, that was never able to be possible before. So uh, this is the commonality of how healthcare data is now available, but now must be used to achieve these four corner post uh, commonalities in these managed care uh, populations. Thank you for that. That's a really good overview. Um, Pat, in your work in New York, it would be great to hear an overview, first of how Health First is organized, because I think that will help inform some of the comments to come, and then also how you've been thinking about analytics in pursuing your, um, your objectives of improving quality uh, while managing costs for your population. Uh, briefly, Health First is a not-for-profit HMO. Um, its uh, uh, market area is New York City and Long Island. We have about 950,000 members. We're the largest Medicaid managed care plan in downstate New York, about 825,000 members. Um, we're the largest Medicare Advantage HMO in New York City with about 112,000 members, about 60,000 of whom are dual. Um, the characteristic of our Medicare Advantage members is dual or low income, so we're really in that segment, having started life as a Medicaid plan. Uh, we have a fairly large, partially capitated Medicaid-managed long-term care plan and are looking at the dual demonstration programs. Um, and we also, I understand as of today, have a few enrollees from the exchange. Um, I don't know how many yet, but we are one of those Medicaid plans that's attempting to provide continuity around the churn. Um, 
The uh, other two things that are a little bit uh, unique about us is that we are hospital sponsored. We have about a dozen hospital sponsors that range from kind of safety net community hospitals to large academic medical center health systems with multiple hospital sites. Um, in our model, since we were founded 20 years ago, our sponsor hospitals assume full financial risk for virtually all of the medical care and services that are consumed by our members who choose PCPs who are affiliated with them. Um, the PCPs include community-based, federally qualified health center. You know, we have probably about 6,000 PCPs in our network. More than half are in the community. Our members have access to our entire network. This is not a limited network product, however, um, our focus is on enabling our providers to succeed in this environment. And the way, the emphasis for us on using data is really to empower our delivery system, whether it's hospital-based, FQHC, community doc, to help us achieve our goals around quality, outcomes, member satisfaction. We really use data, push it, pull it, um, trying to do our best in a very innovative way around this um, because we want the provider system to do the heavy lifting. Um, our members are um, in particular areas of the city. Our providers are culturally competent, very, very important. We have a very diverse membership, very low income, very vulnerable. Um, and so a lot of what we try to do is sort of evaluate, inform, but also help our provider network get to be where we need it to be. Um, and I'll just stop there. That's, that's the overview of our approach towards data. So we'll come back to you. But Brent, at Allscripts, what types of requests are you seeing from your clients? You're coming to them with services that are trying to help with the endeavor that Pat just described. What are they asking of you? It's a great question. It's a, it's a very long list of what they're asking, but there's a couple things that are really, really important for today's discussion. Um, and just, uh, just by way of background, I've spent about 26 or seven years in the healthcare IT space, was fortunate to be the CEO of two or three different companies that were in, involved in very early trends, uh, early in the electronic medical records uh, space with voice-activated technology and then with the web-based EMR technology and then with e-prescribing with Zix prior to Allscripts, came on board four years ago at Allscripts with the mission to help us craft a strategy to uh, think beyond the EHR. Our, our belief, certainly playing out to be true, is that stimulus was gonna drive dramatic adoption, which has finally happened. And we've said we've been two years away from mass EMR adoption for 20 some years now. Uh, but those, those two years are, final, are, are, are finally upon us. So our focus historically has been delivered technology and services to hospitals and providers. We have 200 and some thousand providers, over 2,000 hospital systems, um, over 10,000 post-acute. So tremendous footprint. But our, our entire philosophy and our entire focus has been delivering that technology. Well, it's changed. Uh, the future for us is we've created a real innovation business unit, payer and life sciences unit that I lead. And we've realized that many of our providers have started coming to us, really prompted by meaningful use, uh, but more importantly, driven and enabled by uh, payment reform. Now payers and providers are back on the same team again. They're sharing risk. Um, they're sharing strategy. They're sharing healthcare delivery. They're sharing quality measures. Uh, and so our providers, to your point, Charlotte, started saying, help us with this. We don't know what we're supposed to do in the ACO. We don't really know how we're going to solve all these uh, uh, new administrative tasks that are coming at us, not only from government, but from our leading payers. So we said, let's create a payer strategy around this. And so we started working with uh, several of the key thought leaders, uh, like this distinguished group, uh, and others like Charles Kennedy and Steve Hemsley and uh, uh, Bruce Perkins and Brad Wilson at Blue Crawl and others and said, what, what can we do to help bring payers and providers together? They said, the main thing we need to find out how to do is capture the clinical content that's being created every day. We have all this claims data. Now, how do we work together to communicate with the provider 
in a bi-directional fashion electronically to send and capture clinical content? That's the biggest question that we've been asked for a couple of reasons. Um, the re pay for performance has been a big driver. Quality measures have been a big driver. All of our providers started saying, this is really neat that our leading payers want to create new incentives. But what happens is they tell us retrospectively, we didn't do it right, so we didn't get paid. So they said, how can we learn about the right behavior and the right decision proactively? So that's what we've been trying to do is try to help solve that problem. The great news and the great, the thing that I'm so excited about is for 20 some years we've been talking about adoption. Now we're talking about meaningful use of the clinical content at the point of care, real time. And it takes partners like Inoblon, partnerships like this to do it. And it's exciting to be talking about this topic. So we could talk a lot about sort of the need for data, but when you're actually, when you have that data in hand, what is most useful? So maybe Pat, are you seeing sort of points of pain in the system that the data is illuminating for you? How are you bringing that new information to bear and how is it changing your, the way you do business? So I think everybody in this room is involved in healthcare and this really is a situation of like data, data everywhere and not a drop to drink. From our perspective, since what we're trying to drive is quality and outcomes, member sat, et cetera, uh, we had to spend a fair amount of time trying to figure out what would be an actionable report card. Um, and I think we've got it there because the docs, the actual docs in our network, not you know administrators, the docs who are using these report cards say that they can actually use these to address gaps in care. Um, I'm just going to talk about the sort of the, the clinical quality side. There's a whole financial piece that goes around managing the, you know, the, the risk part of it, but just on the, the quality side, um, our main source of data is administrative. It's the, it's the claims database, which is very robust, as everybody knows, and really can you know, give you continuity across that member's life cycle, no matter where they access care. Um, we use some survey information. We do our own member satisfaction and health risk assessment surveys. Uh, we do our own surveys of access and availability. Um, of our um, providers as well. And we kind of bundle all of this uh, for the New York State Medicaid Quality Incentive Program. It, it's a pretty, the, the good thing about the quality incentive programs now for Medicare and Medicaid is they're very concrete, they're very specific, you know, and they give us our targets. And we just go out with those, layer on some additional information around, you know, especially avoidable admissions, readmissions, that kind of thing. Um, and bundle them into report cards and gaps in care. Um, we try to, we, we, we basically, we have a fairly large quality incentive program um, for all provider types. Um, we're very oriented towards PCPs. We really don't do anything around specialists and you know, that's an HMO mindset. Um, uh, but we, we push this data out. We try to kind of really tell people how they're doing against the targets for them to earn quality incentive. Um, gaps in care are available through the report cards. They're available on monthly member rosters that we send. They're available on a pull down screen from secure intranets so that people can actually see what they're doing. And you know, I think a very important piece as well is that our staff actually go out to a lot of provider sites. Um, candidly, somebody asked questions before about FQHCs. Some FQHCs are really on top of this, other FQHCs, and I'm just using them as an example, may not be as oriented towards these programs, so my staff will go out and sit and explain what is HEDIS, you know, um, what kind of documentation is required in the record, um, what do we get measured by, and we try to explain our reality. We do surplus sharing, et cetera, et cetera, in addition to the quality bonus, so that people can try to be on the same page with this. Um, I think that the pain point for us, but I, I won't call it a pain point exactly, I think it's the next opportunity, is how to sort of figure out what we want from the EMR, because I mean, I still believe that, that health plans are in the best position to kind of see what's going on for the entire member experience. But there are things we're missing. You know, we know the member had a mammogram, but we didn't know whether it was positive or negative. We know the member had a lab test, but we don't know what the values were. So that's in the EMR. Our 
our sponsors, many of them have ACOs and they're very eager to try to figure out. So they also have the piece. They have a very deep dive piece of everything that's gone on with that member in the house and they don't see beyond. So what we're trying to figure out pretty carefully now, because we don't want to boil the ocean and we do not want to be inundated by data, is exactly sitting down with our provider partners. What do we want to achieve? And you know, really almost like having more of a business plan about when we do bi-directional connections to the EMR, what exactly are we giving them? What do they want? What are we taking? What do we want? And you know, we would like it to be actionable instead of just you know, more mounds of data that somebody's trying to shovel through and figure out what to do with. Um, but I think that that is really the next kind of frontier for us and we're excited about it. We're just trying to figure out the best way to go about it. Brent, how do you think about that? Because Pat outlined a challenge even, in, even for a health plan that has um, hospital sponsors, right? So in a less integrated environment, uh, what are some of the challenges that you're hearing or how does how is that overcome? Great question. Um, l let me talk about some of the real life examples of things that are going on today and that we've been working on and doing. Um, one of our first national efforts was with a, uh, a national for-profit health plan that said we, um, we want to send HEDIS alerts to the provider. We know exactly what they are. Diabetic hasn't had his A1C in a year. 50-year-old female needs a mammogram, et cetera. Uh, if based on their analytics and our collective analytics, that, that gap presents itself, we have the ability to put that message into the EHR workflow. It's interesting, um, and that's always been that last mile. Uh, Bill Crown met, you know, articulated it very well from, with Optum Labs earlier that there's technology now enabled to get information to the desktop. We actually are now taking that a step further and putting it into the workflow. So when the physician is going through the EHR and he's evaluating that patient, it, there, 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 there's an icon there with a reminder. Once he sees that reminder, if he takes an action that's documented, well, there's also a hyperlink available to order the test. So that real-time message based on those analytics is really powerful. And then the second thing is the opportunity to extract that information um, electronically instead of the manual processes that are going on today. That creates administrative efficiencies for the practice, real-time transfer of information. Um, like our Novalon partnership, when we, which went live at the first of this month, when we connect, they're connect, Novalon's connecting to our clinical data warehouse, which then where all of our applications feed into, and that data is being accumulated on a daily basis. So these are some of the challenges that needed to be overcome, if you will. Um, but now we're starting to see some really exciting results and some real connection opportunities. To Pat's point, each payer may have little different objectives, whether it's heat is for a Medicare Advantage payer, or whether it's a Blue Care Quality Initiative. Um, uh, each, if you've seen one payer, you've seen one, right? And, and so they each have different objectives and priorities in different markets. And so, but, so all this needs to be customized, but that's just the, the actual data or the message. The exciting thing is the opportunity is there and we're delivering that now to, today. Uh, Keith, going to one point that you raised when you were painting the landscape for managed care, you talked about Medicare Advantage as well as managed Medicaid and the managed care products that are being offered on the exchanges. Um, they have a lot of common challenges, but I'm curious whether you might illuminate whether there are uh, certain things about each of those buckets that you would categorize as distinctive in the way that they're thinking about uh, managing care for the patients under their purview. It's a great question. They are truly uniquely different populations. Um, Pat deals a lot with this uh, in what are called dual eligibles, people that are Medicare and, and Medicaid uh, members. Let's talk a little bit about the commonality to allow us to define the difference. And let's try and bring this down to a granular level. We're talking a lot about high level things like HEDIS uh, that perhaps not a lot of you are familiar with. Let's put it into numbers and let's talk about what the program actually is, and that will elucidate, I think, quite quickly why the data is so critical, and then we can talk about how it's different between Medicare, Medicaid, and commercial. So quality now matters, right, to the tune of about 5% of the reimbursement to a health plan under the STARS program. 
uh, STARS program is roughly 53 different measures. Whether you got a mammogram, whether your blood pressure is under control, whether or not your hemoglobin A1C, a reflection of your diabetes uh, is under control, and a host of others, but also including things like satisfaction, something that you'll uh, here in a moment is quite different uh, in a Medicare, Medicaid, and commercial populations or the considerations thereof. So these 53 different things, which you as a health plan, if you're trying to figure out your budgetary current status, let alone future status, because it takes multiple years for this data to percolate through its creation, its measurement, and its impact on your financial performance, is the lifeblood of what health plans today live and die by. Because under these programs, not only are you now getting up to 5% if you score really well in quality, but you're having it taken away, if you will, on the other end. It's an accelerated Darwinism in Medicare Advantage. So difference number one is in Medicare Advantage, quality matters. All three of them quality manage, matter. But in Medicare Advantage, that now matters so much that in a world where most health plans have a profit margin of only a couple of percent, 5% of that can be impacted, 5% of your 100 can be impacted by your quality. So 53 measures to what Brent was saying, how do we pull all that data out? How do we analyze it? How do we, to what Pat was saying, how do we make sense of it so that we're not looking at piles and piles of data, but rather direction for a provider to actually act upon to achieve higher quality uh, results. Um, this is what results in a higher quality result in Medicare Advantage in the state of New York, like where Pat uh, operates. You also have the QAR program, which is a similar quality-based program on the Medicaid side. Put these things two together, they're very important to health plans like Health First in New York. So in the commercial exchange, the STAR program is also being applied. December 10th, uh, CMS came out and said, or HHS came out and said, we're going to have a STAR program for the commercial side. Not all the aspects have been defined, but presumptively the same components. And in managed Medicaid, it's state by state. Now, if all of them have a quality program, what are the differences? Socioeconomic is a huge, huge difference between Medicare, Medicaid, and commercial. Uh, in Medicaid, as we know, as a safety net, they are a challenged population that are challenging to manage, let alone locate um, in where they actually uh, are. And in Medicare Advantage, you have a lot of access issues, uh, elderly, uh, and communication, and understanding of very complex disease states. Uh, and then the commercial space, you have dominant, dominant consumerism uh, issues and choice of care and, and where they want to get that care. Enter organizations like Walgreens uh, in, in that scenario to allow people to do it on their way to work or coming home from work or on a weekend. Um, so you have very different socioeconomic groups. You have different forces in different vehicles. Somebody like Elliot Fisher this morning uh, would tell you one of the challenges uh, on Monday. He's with the Brookings Institute down in D.C. where they're going to talk about how do we manage so many different quality measures. I mean, there's actually hundreds of them. Right? There's 53 of them, sure, in STAR. Um, but in New York, there's a whole slew of additional ones in different states. They have fantastic ideas in there. There's different pharmacy ones. So a doctor trying to do the right thing has a tough time doing the right thing. If they use a system like Allscripts where it helps tell you what the right thing is, if they do it in a collaborative environment like Pat's where they can all agree on what the right thing is, um, we can make better progress. But um, the commonalities are there on a macro level. Uh, but Charlotte, as you dive down into the individual populations, you'll find that it is quite different serving each one and the individual details of the regulatory environment are quite different. Um, how, how does a privacy factor in? Is, again, is that a uniform issue uh, that can be quite simply applied across these populations or is there variation? Uh, um, the HIPAA and high tech rules which govern uh, at the highest level of these things apply across the board. So there is uh, a challenge, as you imply with your question, that, okay, if data is one of the answers to helping improve healthcare, um, are there barriers to its access and use to allow us to get that job done? Um, and there are insofar as there are guidelines and restrictions about how the data is supposed to be used, and there are certain costs and uh, oversights required for how to make sure it's being done uh, properly. 
but the walls are definitely set up to allow for it to be done the right way, uh, but with great caution, great care, and a bit of expense uh, to protect it. Um, I would argue uh, that a healthcare data portability act, which has been proposed on several, uh, several occasions in Washington, uh, would be a great assistance to the typical member and patient in the population. Uh, and this is, if you switch from one healthcare system to another, might your data go along with you? Today it doesn't. Um, today, under the arguments of HIPAA and high tech, it remains in the health plan from whence you came. With the exception that in Medicare Advantage, if you switch from one Medicare Advantage plan to another one, um, a high level HCC, hierarchical condition category uh, level description of your disease comes with you, but not the detail of what rolled up into that definition. Um, I would think that uh, health plans today certainly can navigate this and implement their own agreements with other health plans with the patient's permission to transfer this data. I, as a patient, would be very quick to sign up to a health plan that said, we care about your outcome so much that if you did decide to leave us, we would send your data on with your permission if you'd like because it will help reduce your costs when you get there because a new patient arriving, you don't know what all of these test scores are, all these lab results are, what your past medical history is in detail. So you can avoid the retesting, redocumentation, reestablishment of all these things called risk score statuses and quality score statuses. If the health plan that pushed that as we care about you, uh, I think in the growing world of consumerism that would have quite a bit of appeal. Pat, when you're thinking about uh, the projects that you've implemented at Health First, um, which, what do you see as the next generation? It sounds like you're, you're in active work on a few specific projects to try to get actionable items, but what's the roadmap that you see for Health First going forward as you get better at what you're doing now and think about next steps? Yeah, I think um, figuring out the best way to connect to the electronic medical record in some of our larger systems is definitely you know, that's, that's sort of on the external side. Internally, giving our providers better lookup capability, drill down capability, marrying um, some of the care management and member services information that we have on our members into a true CRM, which we don't have yet, um, would be very important to give more of a 360 degree um, view. And I, I think uh, that's kind of, that's kind of where it is. I, I also think, and I, th I think Keith mentioned this, one of the things that really is still missing from the data interchange is sort of like a, an opinion on what should be done. And you know, that is something that Innovalon has excelled at. It's just here are the gaps you know, in terms of electronic data flow. Um, I, I think that that's going to be important. At some point, you know, our financial information, which really has a slightly different audience in our hospital sponsors and really has to do with management of risk, but, you know, we, we, we account for our, um, our risk hospitals almost as many HMOs, so there's, there's reserves, there's risk adjustment, there's adjustments for members who are switching TCPs in the middle of the month. You know, at some point, marrying those a little bit more closely um, probably is a goal. Um, I, I would say that one piece that we still feel frustrated with um, and that I, I think there's more opportunity is around pharmacy. Um, you know, uh, medication management, medication adherence, and um, uh, the doctor before from Walgreens and I had an interesting conversation about this. You know, um, pharmacies and PBMs have very robust medical records now. Um, when one of my members walks into uh, a pharmacy and gets a flu shot, I get the claim. So I at least didn't know that it happened, even though for purposes of these quality programs, it's a, it's a CAPS, it's a survey response, not a, not a claim-based response. And, you know, as we move forward and the scope of services expands, you know, the question that I have, I guess, is my ultimate goal, my ultimate goal is that everything goes into the EMR. Because if I've got a member who is seeing a doc at a particular hospital and the docs change over, everything is in the EMR. And so there's continuity of care and there's continuity of treatment and knowledge for that, for that member. Right now, because things are a little 
siloed and segmented. There's a lot of ancillary databases that, uh, so I think a next step is to sort of figure out what providers will accept into their EMR to populate and make them more robust. But to me, that is, you know, that is sort of the, the ultimate gold standard, is to get it all in there. In, to, to echo and, and expand on this issue, so let me give you a few different stats that will perhaps boggle you a little bit. A Medicare Advantage member, uh, let's take one in, in, in Pat's uh, health plan, sees on average about 5.2 different physicians per year at multiple different encounters per year and at multiple different office locations uh, per year. So a member in Health First might have been seen across town a week ago and when they're seeing me as a physician, you have no idea that they were just seen a week ago. Maybe they had labs done and you don't know. Um, maybe they had a medication change and you don't know. Um, so the health plan, to echo uh, Pat's uh, point, is really at a growing center point of insight ability in the landscape. All right, so this is one of the things that ACOs seek to achieve, but today the health plan, because they're the ultimate payer, at least has purview, has the ability and legal right to capture in all this information, but where is the platform that enables it. Um, to speak to things like this, we on the behalf of health plans bring in this data. We bring in this data for about 140 million Americans uh, across the country every day. And that data flows in and we analyze it to the goals that organizations like Health First have, quality, risk score, utilization, compliance, and so forth. And through partners such as uh, Walgreens, for instance, if one of Health First's members needs to be seen and to uh, Dr. London uh, earlier, they can walk into a Walgreens, we can schedule them there, and that Walgreens clinician will actually have access to the insight of all of those encounters that that Medicare Advantage member had at those 5.2 different doctors across all the different locations in New York as if they had happened at any point all inside one single healthcare system. That system's linked in with uh, all scripts so that if an EMR pool was necessary to accumulate that picture, it all goes into one platform. The commonality is the power of the data. The commonality is the data that the health plan has already paid to have an encounter for. They've already paid for the lab, they've paid for the medication, they've paid for the actual physical uh, encounter, um, but the information's not helping them manage the member unless they have access to it. And then to make it one more, to Pat's point, you can't go wade yourself through you know, multiple feet deep in, in, in data. You need to have it made sense and pushed back out in the very systems that the health plans are using, um, the EMR systems, uh, that being the increasing uh, case. So, I mean, this is happening. Um, you know, to a comment Brett uh, said earlier, um, was, was for 28 years, you've been saying it's coming within two years. Um, you know, this is happening now, all right? Um, one could argue that the macroeconomic forces that the regulatory environment has put in place, the macroeconomic forces of quality matters, disease and risk score uh, accuracy matters, utilization rates uh, matter, and compliance uh, matters, um, the macro forces they've put in place have unlocked or unleashed the strongest forces I would argue this country has, and that being one of innovation and achievement that is now conquering this very rapidly, not glacially, like one could argue uh, it has been in the past, but now very, very rapidly, literally months now mark huge innovative changes in the data capabilities in the healthcare system. So get your questions ready. I'll ask one more question of the panel. Um, Pat, the dual eligible population has historically been an immensely challenging one. Um, people have talked for a long time about how best to serve these patients who are eligible for both Medicaid and Medicare. Uh, and there are different experiments playing out across the country. Um, when you look at that dual population, how do some of the lessons that we've been speaking about more generally across all types of patients apply specifically to duals? How are you kind of tailoring your work around trying to manage their care? Okay. Um, it's a really, really important question. So um, our dual members, obviously, m multiple Comor comorbid conditions, polypharmacy, 
Um, many of them are not English speaking or even literate in their native languages. So I would say that um, you know, finding the right primary care environment for them and empowering that primary care environment with all of the information possible about what's going on with the member and what they need is very important. Um, culturally competent providers, it's like impossible unless you have folks, doctors who speak the language, understand that you know, their population is taking herbs on the side with their prescribed medication and they're not telling anybody and they don't really wanna tell anybody because it's okay, don't tell the doctor, they don't understand. Uh, you know, most of the pharmacies that our um, members use are community pharmacies because the, the, the big retail chains tend not to be in the neighborhoods where our members live. So recognizing important partners in the community who are already kind of helping those folks is very important. Um, and it's also, you know, for our dual members, there's a, there's a different, you know, Unlike Medicaid, where enrollment is not stable because of fluctuating eligibility, in Medicare it is stable, which is a good thing, um, but understanding how our members communicate and like to receive information. They don't want to receive information, by and large, over a smartphone. Um, if you send them something in the mail, they are likely to talk to a family member for help. They're likely to, to look for one of our community offices or one of our reps that they represent. Uh, who, who, whom they recognize in the neighborhood to help them. So knowing how to communicate with them is very important, just blasting pieces of paper saying, you know, you're not medic you know, adherent with your medicines is probably not as effective. Um, I think uh, going forward, looking at the, the, the dual demonstrations, and we, we have a program like this, which is a fully integrated dual eligible SNP, which takes the sort of Medicare paid acute care medical pharmacy benefit um, and also takes the Medicaid paid long-term care benefit for duals who are eligible for long-term care services and putting them under we're trying to put them under one roof because you know Medicaid and Medicare at the CMS level are not really integrated either, um, is going to be a huge opportunity. Um, very challenging as well, but I think that there are exciting opportunities when everything is under one roof to try to figure out you know, how you manage the member. You know, if they're in the hospital, because you're in the home with them, what can you do to take care of them at home, prevent readmissions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, those are some of the elements that I would say, but we, we find our provider community to be really quite important in this regard. Um, and we do, as a health plan, our care management system, our member services reps who, you know, for our Medicare members are helping them with everything under the sun, our, and our care managers are doing housing, they're doing heat, they're doing food, um, our care management protocols are set up in such a way to deal with the issue that is most bothering the member first um, because our philosophy is if you can't take care of that, they're not gonna pay attention to their health. They have lots of other things going on in their lives. So if their issue is that they lost their eyeglasses or you know, their heat's getting turned off, our care managers are actually working on that stuff first, so. I think that's a really good reminder as we talk about with this new age of data, being reminded of the really hard work on a granular level that goes on that's not particularly uh, high tech, but making sure your heat is turned on is certainly yeah. important. Um, questions from the audience for our panelists? Yes, right here in the middle. Someone will come to you with a microphone. Hi, I'm uh, Joan Saba, I'm a healthcare architect and planner with NBBJ. And I have one question for all of you. And if you were given a data-driven healthcare magic wand to make one thing happen from your point of view that would better the situation or move it along, what, what would it be? That's a good how, question. How big is the wand? Can we, I mean, can we wish for more wishes? <clears throat> Do we each get a wand? Yeah, well, shall we just go down the list? Keith, maybe beginning with you? Um, sure, and I didn't catch uh, your name, forgive me. Joan. Joan. Um, 
you know, Joan, if you believe that uh, healthcare data helps to inform and drive a far better achievement of quality utilization uh, outcomes and financial performance, which we strongly do, then it is the availability and access to the holistic uh, data um, that really would be that wand waving. So, so you know, HIPAA and high tech has its place. The protections around that have their place. Uh, but none of us should legislatively or regulatorily cut off our nose to spite our face. Um, if we are truly in this for the benefit of the member, and I believe in today's healthcare system, the environment is set up such that if you serve the member well, um, you will yourself as a health plan or another constituent of the landscape also benefit. So access to that information, bringing down the barriers between it, as that is a little bit of a localized protectionism, if you will, uh, needs to improve. That would be my magic wand. Um, so I agree with that. Um, but I have my own magic wand, so I'll add to his magic wand. We got three up here, which is really great. Um, I think it does go back to um, sort of a magic wand that sort of aligns the um, perspective of payers on the one hand, because I'm looking at the member, I got 950,000 members, I don't care where they're getting their care, I'm like focused on that. And large provider systems, whether they're ACOs or population driven, whose perspective is, I just want to take care of all my patients the same way. I don't want to have to have 20 different protocols for the different plans with their view of how they best take care of their members. So, you know, number one is to find the common ground there. Um, and really um, have a lot more intelligence around how to exchange data, what to exchange that's meaningful and that would actually change outcomes and then create pipes to do that very easily. Brent. My wand. I'll tell you, following these two, it's like in New England, it's like coming in late in the fourth quarter following up for Tom Brady in a, in a Patriots <laughs> game. Um, my wand would be, or my biggest wish would be alignment. And, and what I mean by that is where we're really focused together in these strategic partnerships to make meaningful change is to first we, um, we align, we have to align messaging and exchange with providers with their incentives and their quality measures. Then, um, so the payer then becomes aligned with the provider. We then, in the future, want to take that a step further, and we want to align the patient with what the provider asked them to do, which is based on what the payer's analytics recommended. So as we look out in the future, today we are, we are as, as Keith said, we are delivering bi-directional exchange, messaging, capturing medical records. We have taken all these manual tasks and have started to automate them together, which is super exciting. Um, and then if you take that same alignment, payer, quality, and provider with their incentives, and then you extend that to the patient as we go forward into healthcare and we extend the same communication through the patient portals and to the consumer, now we've, now we've completed the cycle. And then as that information then comes back through an Enovalon back to the payer, um, that's, that's what my wand would do. We would complete the circle. Other questions? Yes, in front here. Bill Crown, uh, Optum Labs. Um, I really sort of enjoyed the discussion about bringing data uh, into the hands of the physician at the point of care and how you know, rapidly we're making progress there. Uh, but I'm thinking back to a paper that was published by uh, John Seeger, who's a well-regarded pharmacoepidemiologist at Harvard uh, about 10 years ago. And this was a study of um, looking at patients with cardiovascular disorders who were uh, treated with statins versus those that weren't. And if you looked at the risk of a subsequent AMI in those two groups, the statin group, uh, had about twice the risk of having a heart attack downstream as the non 
uh, statin group did. And we were looked at that these days and says, oh, well, I guess we shouldn't be treating patients with statins. And then uh, after the patients were matched, um, so that they were balanced in terms of uh, comorbidity profiles and so forth, you saw the reverse of that. Uh, and the statin group had a, uh, about a 40% lower risk of uh, AMI. So I, the question really is, in this world of big data, as we put more data in the hands of physicians, how do we avoid kind of making the wrong decision on something that, where the evidence really seems so clear cut, but it's, it actually isn't correct? Tricky. Yep, Keith. So it's a great question, right? And, and we've seen over recent years a lot of you know, groundbreaking research be reversed or modified or caveated. Um, causes a lot of, of challenge uh, in the consumer's uh, understanding of what they're supposed to be doing. So, you know, first of all, there are agendas that are out there, right? So how do, you know, research costs money. Uh, it takes infrastructure, people, processes, um, and uh, sometimes the best of intentions uh, can be biased, um, for sure, or people don't wait for the full answer. Um, but at the end of the day, I think we're making tremendous progress, even in these 10 years, uh, that the larger sets of data now allow for that controlling from the beginning. Um, let me give you a quick example. So we have approximately 7.5 billion medical events in our system today um, across uh, about 98 uh, million unique uh, individuals and it's uh, growing uh, every day and this goes back you know, a, a decade in time. And uh, a couple of years ago you might remember that there was a scare regarding a, a study that came out regarding uh, insulin and GI uh, cancers. So there was identified to be an increased incidence in uh, GI cancers in patients that take uh, insulin, and all of a sudden uh, we had uh, a concern across the healthcare landscape of, oh my gosh, all these people that we've been trying to get to manage their diabetes really well are now reading these headline you know, sound bites uh, in the media that, uh, they, that insulin might give them GI cancer. Well, the study that led to that conclusion took several years to be done and was over several thousand patients. Um, we were contacted uh, to look at a larger data set, millions and millions and millions of patients. And in the course of you know, the proverbial days, uh, we're able to, in fact, put out an analysis across millions of diabetics and say, in fact, this, this is not true. Uh, there is confounding uh, data that has led to an incorrect uh, conclusion. So large data sets um, really do uh, broaden the ability to look at uh, a more holistic consideration of what is necessary to be done to control for these different studies, um, something that historically we were all taught in medical school and our various different graduate programs, you needed to do blinded, prospective studies over many, many years. Something that's contributed to what you've heard earlier today that it takes 15, 17, sometimes here 30 years to go from bench to bedside uh, in healthcare. Part of that is because historically a limiting factor was in order to get statistical power in a prospective, randomized, controlled study, that which the New England Journal of Medicine and JAMA and Science all wants us to have, um, it took a while to get to that power size. And the things that required those uh, disciplines to be applied statistically are all but reversed or, or, or made irrelevant by the massive sizes of data that we now have. So we have this ability to accelerate scientific conclusion. It does take some cultural adaptation in the scientific community, um, but now the data sets are so large that the greater side of valor is to pay attention to those answers and not require the 15, 17, or 35 years to have us apply some good common sense. Well, there's a much longer discussion we can have about the FDA and clinical trial design. Um, but yes, right here from Harvard Pilgrim. Good memory, Tarek Abu Jabber. I'm, I'm going to ask a purposefully, um, what's that word? I can't even think of the word. Um, just a provocative question. I'm not even sure I believe it, but I'm curious what you, well, what you all have to say. 
Um, there's a part of me that constantly thinks about the immense amount of time and effort and resources and costs that we put into trying to fix the healthcare system. Um, we got ourselves in this, in this bizarre position by having a demand-driven uh, supply-based industry, you know, where the, the person performing the service and charging you for it is telling you what you need, um, and they don't know, tell you what it costs because somebody else is paying the bill. I mean, absolutely perverse by any economist's measure. And, and so we've built these phenomenal Rube Goldbergs around it to fix it. So, okay, we're going to have this, you know, um, uh, risk-based payments, but it's going to be risk-adjusted, and then we'll have disease management to make sure you don't get sick, and then there's these little incentive payments you get if the quality goes up, and if it's a Tuesday, you know, after a while you begin to think, wow, is this a phenomenal waste of money? Are we spending $10 to save two? And there's a part of me that says, should we just strip it way back like house insurance and, if, and let economics, basic microeconomics, take their course? make people highly liable for their health care costs with catastrophic protection, just like home insurance. You know, you don't go around telling, saying that a carpenter, do anything, someone else is paying for it. Um, and with, with that, again, I'm not even sure what I believe here, but I'm really curious what you think. And just kick back and let the marketplace take care of it. Catastrophic insurance, what do we think? You know, I mean, Obviously, one of the options on the exchange, you know, is one of the, the programs that qualifies as a catastrophic. You know, I think that it's a really, really legitimate topic of conversation, and it continues and continues as to the best way to kind of incentivize people basically to take more responsibility for their consumption of health care, which is really what you're talking about. You know, in the non-governmental space, obviously, high deductible health plans try to um, stimulate that, and um, I think that it's interesting. Um, you know, in my space, there aren't even copays for, as a practical matter, for um, you know uh, folks who are, are very very poor. Um, you know, if there are, it's a buck or two, and I think most providers waive them. So I think it depends a little bit on. Um, the tools that you have to incentivize different behavior. I, I am in agreement with some of the earlier speakers from the program today, though, that um, whatever we do, there should be, we do need to figure out a better way for people to feel some responsibility for and control over their own health care. So I think it's a really important question, and uh, I was encouraged from the earlier sessions that people are really working on this stuff. So. Maybe there will be more tools and um, some of the insurance and payment mechanisms to go with it. Having said that, the one thing that I will say is I really I do believe that the fee for service system is, you know, it's it's it really bad incentives. There's some areas where it might be appropriate, but by and large, it's a good thing that um, the provider community is really embracing different ways of um, understanding their costs and their revenue. One, one just maybe, maybe to follow on comment um, is totally agree with you, but I've, I already gave up my wand, so I can't, I can't, we can't, we can't fix that issue today. So in the meantime, one, just one quick comment is a lot of the things we're talking about here, some of this bi-directional communication, utilizing data, claims, and clinical, what we're doing is we're leveraging tools that already exist, and we're refining them and we're creating better connectivity, but it's actually going to take some cost out of the system in many cases. It costs a lot to fly people in and capture medical records, right? To stay on site, to dedicate administrative staff. It takes time, it takes energy, there's mistakes, there's human error, and it's really costly. Um, to do that electronically, send the exact same information, nothing more, nothing less, electronically uh, at the without even having to push a button, saves a lot of money on all sides of that equation. So leveraging existing tools in the meantime before all that happens is kind of what we're thinking about here. Yeah, I, I, would, uh, I would encourage you to um, take a slightly more optimistic uh, view. Um, I can appreciate the implied frustrations with putting a Band-Aid on top of a Band-Aid on top of a, a, a Band-Aid. I don't think that's what's happening right now. Um, I think that 
the, the advances that are being made today are going in the right direction. Um, there's a lot of uh, statistics that are out now, a lot of articles, a lot of articles, uh, I'll put in a plug for the economists that are in uh, The Economist quite uh, regularly about, you know, are we seeing evidence of a, of a bend in the trend? Is this macro bend in the trend occurring because of the, of the greater economic situation that's happening in the United States? And there are people that have views on this. There's people that have views that as the economy, quote, bounces back, we should see a return to the previous trend, um, but we haven't seen it yet, right? So, so the financial performance of healthcare over the last five years is inexplicably different than the five years that preceded that. Um, what are the forces on that? Um, there is an attention on improving quality and improving care and restricting what things can be spent on, these MOR rules as we call them, that sure, they'll always have loopholes, right? They'll always have caveats, there'll always be um, people that perhaps interpret them differently than they were arguably intended to be um, imposed, but the, the trend is that a force of Darwinism is at play. And this country thrives on that force. Um, and you're seeing, we're seeing uh, on, on a, not in one location, not Keith, please name me, you know, a few that you can think of. I mean, CEO after CEO after CEO is picking up the phone and saying, how are we gonna win? Okay, I got it, here are the rules. I'm not saying I like them or don't like them, but here are the rules, how are we gonna win? And that force is a very powerful economic force. It's not dictating which 3,500 ICD-9 codes should be important. It's not saying which quality measures should be important. People will disagree on this for decades to come. They'll switch, they'll change every year. But the macro point is quality now matters. The uniqueness of the individual now matters. Utilization can't just go to the bottom line. It needs to be spent on the right things or returned back or premiums reduced. The macro forces that have been put in play that are accelerating, that are now you know, 70, 80 million members of our country um, and are driving huge innovative uh, changes are at, at work and are driving a change. And we'll debate for a few years as to when the trend is due to that or due to other forces, but we're no longer looking at the deltas. We're no longer looking at the difference in Medicare Advantage between the fee-for-service and the managed Medicare portion like we were six, seven years ago. We're no longer looking at the macro growth rates of spend. Um, we're seeing a different world today, and it's only getting more improved more rapidly on a member level. Well, that's a very optimistic view in contrast to some of the other things we've heard today. Um, there was another question over here, yes. Uh, Deborah Prothorstedt from Spencer Stewart. I have a question about um, public health. So data-driven health as opposed to just healthcare. And I'm wondering if you're seeing examples of um, the data, the big data collected being used for the epidemiology that would deal with some of the social determinants of health. Um, for example, um, you know, a public health commissioner wants to know about herd immunity in the community or whether the school bus uh, park, uh, parking location is contributing to the children's uh, asthma, uh, the number of asthma attacks, um, that kind of public health uh, data that won't be member specific or healthcare specific, but if we're really trying to get healthier and reduce costs, um, you know, those data become very important. And, and people in public health kind of see this as our opportunity to be a part of the bottom line, and I'm not sure where that opportunity is, but your thoughts on that would be, I think, extremely helpful. Uh, I. Um, First of all, the answer is yes. Um, yes, that's happening. Um, not down to the school bus level, perhaps. Um, we believe that's very, very important. Uh, I will tell you that uh, research for these sorts of things is frankly only justified in the moral, ethical, right thing to do in healthcare world because it's very hard financially to put a price 
benefit on those individual small projects, but you're seeing them be done uh, repeatedly. Um, you know, we, we, we put out a, a study just shortly ago, the largest study of its kind on dual eligibles, looking at the socioeconomic factors and other factors controlling for them and saying, look, there's, there's something else going on here. And if you want to get something done in the political world, you don't actually say what the answer is. You say, gosh, shouldn't this uh, deserve to get more attention um, um, so that you know, smarter people can debate it. Um, you have organizations doing that, you know, the Heart Rhythm Society, the you know, CMS, NCQA, you know, different organizations out there that come to organizations like ours and many others um, and say, what's the answer to this really important to us question? Uh, we have a whole analytics uh, group, they report to a gentleman who's here in the audience, uh, Dan Rizzo, our chief innovation officer, that they can spend their time to analyze questions like this, not down to the bus level, but down to these other levels, like what are the confounding factors here, what are the commonalities here, uh, and you know, we, we set aside material amount of resources to finance that because it's the right thing to do, and because you know, one of the things that you hear is a common question, I heard it many times this morning, you're talking incentivization, incentivization, incentivization. Um, incentivization is a very important driving force in healthcare today. But I will remind people that people go into healthcare because they actually care. Um, uh, I went into medicine because I actually care. My wife went into medicine because she actually cares. My sister went into medicine because she actually cares. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, you're trying to do something uh, that makes a difference, that mm -hmm. has an impact. Not everything has to have a dollar attached uh, to it. Um, you know, certainly you're bound by a lot of different forces and have to keep the lights on and you have to, you know, uh, pay your employees and, and run a good and prudent business for your shareholders. Um, but people go into healthcare because they care. And, um, and so therefore, as the mechanisms become increasingly available to do these sorts of studies, um, and they are intuitively um, sensible to do, um, we see people doing them. And I think you'll see that more and more as data becomes more and more accessible. We, uh, and, that so, happens in New York City. They have, pardon me, but they have um, alerts from different hospitals. They have a very mm -hmm. sophisticated system for pooling data from facilities all over the um, all over the city. You know, that's part of what Google Google Flu Trends does. Mm -hmm. In particularly with pandemic flu, that's been a big area of investment as. One might imagine uh, you want to read all that data very quickly and carefully to contain an outbreak, but Keith, you were going to. No, I mean, there's large programs that are on around the country. Uh, the FDA implemented a program called Sentinel. You know, there's different philosophies about hub and spoke, you know, data aggregation. It's a real mess, I will tell you, because, um, you know, as both of my colleagues up here can tell you, everybody stores their data in a slightly different way. So in an attempt to not actually have access to the data, so that getting back to the question about HIPAA and high tech, you know, if you say, okay, I don't want access to it, I just need the answer to this question. Is the flu spreading or something else? Is liver function deteriorating in the setting of this medication launch? Um, you know, if you ask it in the wrong way, you know, um, garbage in, garbage out on your question. So um, it really is a more comp, it's a very sensible thing that we're getting closer to doing. Projects are working on it. Um, there are examples of it working. It should work better and it will increasingly work better in time. And, and some of that fits into some of the population health initiatives that we have where we're working with a lot of community health centers, a lot of primary care physicians around the country, and there's two types of, of potential members or patients, those that come to the practice and those that don't. And now, because of a lot of the things that are changing in healthcare, they're starting to become responsible for these populations. And the question is, well, how do we reach those that we never get to treat? How do we find out who's at risk? And so there are a lot of initiatives, programs, research going on, and a lot of technology that's working toward that objective. But that's a, it's a big problem to solve. Yeah, and shared responsibility. Shared responsibility. Right. Where the public health community actually try to intersect. That's right. That's right. And this is an area that your, your Dart, there's several Dartmouth colleagues here in the audience. Uh, Elliot Fisher would, uh, you know, have, have a lot to say about this as well. You know, evaluating which is the best process 
right? And you have to be careful that you don't legislate out innovation, right? Because, you know, drug company X, Y, and Z have a different approach to blood pressure management. And if you come out and you say, well, we're only going to take the best one, um, when our, there are different phenotypes and genotypes in which they have varying impact and efficacy and complication rates, but at the end of the day, you could mathematically say which one is, quote, better for dollar cost. Um, you need to be careful that you don't stifle out the innovation that follows on the pathway or on the, on the, uh, the heels of those pharmacological uh, developments. So there, we have to be careful that the best of intention here does not stymie longer-term innovation and investment. We have time for a few more questions if there are others from the audience. Yes. Uh, my name is Dwayne Hofstetter. I'm with a device company, DJO Global. Um, we hear a lot, uh, certainly about the patients, providers, the payers. How can device manufacturers that truly want to help impact patients' lives for the better, what tools are in place and how can we help be part of the solution? How can we work closer with payers? Um, we seem to have great relationships with providers but it's really the payers. How can we work more closely together to uh, develop technology solutions that might be beneficial? You know, from my perspective, it really, I think your work with the providers is more critical. We are not providers, and I think that what we would really rely upon is that our providers really have the best most up-to-date and most sophisticated understanding of what works, what doesn't work. Um, you know, I do think that within provider systems, um, achieving some uniformity of view so that, you know, your orthopedic surgeons are not ordering five different kinds of hips because that's actually, for a replacement, that's actually not cost efficient. There's a lot of work to be done there. I'm not sure what role device manufacturers have to do with that, but. Um, you know, I think that the hope is that providers, you know, would really hone in on the most cost-effective, um, high-value um, set of devices and, um, you know, pass the benefits of that from a quality and an outcome and a cost perspective on to the payers. And, you know, it's something that we kind of are aware of, but I also understand the complexity within a large hospital system, for example, negotiating all of that. I appreciate the question, though, so think about it. So I'll give you a challenging answer. Um, if you have the best device, transparency is your friend. Um, Pat can tell when a member of her health plan has received a knee replacement by certain claim codes. Um, we could look at the number of units of blood that followed or the length of hospital stay or other confounding factors that may have been the result of maybe there was a pulmonary embolism later, maybe there wasn't. Um, but you'd be surprised at how difficult it is to even be able to understand what kind of device was put in. So I know a knee replacement was done. I know it went well or didn't go well by these criteria, but I actually don't know in the claims data what device was put in. Um, I can narrow down which physician did it, which facility, which date, and therefore go to the medical record. Perhaps they're using all scripts, and I can look into the OR documentation to see that it was a X versus Y manufacturer of device and draw conclusions uh, from that. Um, but it takes a bit of work. So despite all the regulatory oversight, FDA and otherwise, um, the requirements upon the various different device manufacturers to actually make sure that information gets into the payer, let alone providers, system in a, which, in a way which is objectively analyzable and trackable is slim to none. So if you have the best device, transparency is your friend because uh, that will bear out and you will win the war. Um, so anything that you can do to help that, people are getting to it. They're going to get to it one way or the other to voluntarily facilitate it just it makes you look like um, you really must believe that you have the best device. Yeah, I, I guess that I would add to that, and I don't know what kinds of devices you're talking about, but I'm sort of thinking about joint replacements, for example. I don't know the extent to which um, companies that manufacture these things actually 
do their own research over total cost of care, you know, that lead to a sort of a bundled payment or making a, facilitating a provider organization to do a bundled payment, because um, this is what it's all about, right? It's like, you know, you know, prep beforehand, discharge planning before, and you probably have a lot of information on that that could assist um, the provider community in understanding and maybe even intervening if you, across your entire database of customers who have used your devices, see things that work. Because um, I, I do think that, you know, um, those kinds of analyses and that kind of information would be very useful to providers and to, to me, in turn, and other payers. I, I mean, as the market is shifting from quantity to quality, you know, from utilization to value, um, you have an enormous opportunity to appeal to provider hybrid groups, right, the ACO being the easy example, but there's a lot of other integrated healthcare delivery systems out there that aren't ACOs. Um, but as they increasingly look at the holistic cost of care, to be able to represent here is the data as to why you should use my product over something else, um, accelerated Darwinism goes in your favor, and uh, you'll do very well.